Hello and welcome to our presentation. I'm Stephen Scott, owner of Terroir Seeds, the home of Underwood Gardens, along with my wife Cindy. Terroir Seeds is an open pollinated and heirloom seed company. Uh, we specialize in vegetable, herbs, and flowers for home gardeners and small-scale growers. Today's presentation is called The Cycle of Terroir. We're going to look at uh, the soil, the seed, the food that you eat, how everything combines uh, one from the other, and the interrelatedness there. We're going to start with uh, how to build healthy soil, uh, look at some concepts and some history that, that are definitely not mainstream but have been very proven. From there we're going to uh, work into the heirloom seeds and from that look at the nutritious food and the health that follows from that. Please understand that this is an overview. We will get into some detail on some things, but in many of these disciplines we're going to look at, people have multiple doctorates in each discipline. So this is more of an overview to get you interested, get you introduced, give you a little bit of good information so that uh, it should serve as a jumping off point uh, for further education. So what exactly is terroir? What is its definition? Some people have heard the, the term used mainly in the wine community. And why is it important, especially today? Um, of course the wine community in America has used the, the term terroir to mean the specific taste of the grapes grown in the specific place and how that taste translates into the wine. And, and people are sometimes amazed to understand and, and be able to taste the differences between grapes grown sometimes as little as two to three miles apart, harvested fairly closely in time, and fermented out into a very similar, if not exactly the same, type of wine. But you can taste the differences. Um, in addition to the wine community, the farming community, chefs, and gardeners have also become uh, interested in starting to use the term. And of course terroir in its most basic translation means soil, but it also in its looser, more generalized translation means everything that we, we just talked about. Is this terroir? Is this what comes to your mind when you hear the word terroir? A lot of people, do, it does. It's, it's a, um, a hillside, a lush pastoral hillside covered in grapes, either in the vision is the south of France or in Napa, um, and it definitely can mean this. And this is where most Americans have come to understand the phrase, um, where the specific soil, the specific conditions uh, work to create uh, a very memorable, very uh, tasty wine. Here are several other examples of terroir, some that are very common, such as the wines and some of the cheeses. Uh, some folks are a little more uh, understanding of the different cheeses from the different regions of the world. But, but look at the squash in the background as well. Look at the breads, uh, the table grapes, and also the nuts. Those also will uh, exhibit their own terroirs. And of course, people are, are learning more about the meats and uh, the different flavors of the different regions, different areas, not just in the world, but across the U.S., of how different soil produces its own expression of terroir. What about this? What about this handful of soil right here? Is this terroir? Yes, it is. This is the foundational example of terroir, and this is one of the things we really wanted to focus on, especially in the beginning, as everything comes from the soil. The health of the plants, the production of the fruits, the vegetables, not only the, the volume, but uh, the, the quality of the fruits and vegetables, everything that's produced, uh, and of course that has direct connotations for the nutritional quality of the food, and from that comes our health. So everything starts with the soil. So taking things a step further, can one be a terroirist? And what does that mean? Or is that a bit too elitist? Can one really learn to focus and really care about exactly where their food came from? I'd like to introduce you to a foundational 
piece of writing uh, from a good friend of ours, Dr. Gary Nabhan. The Terroirist's Manifesto for Eating in Place. It really kind of will introduce some of the concepts that we talk about a little more. Know where your food has come from through knowing those who produced it for you. From farmer to forager, rancher or fisher, to earthworms building a deeper, richer soil. To the heirloom vegetable, the nitrogen-fixing legume, the pollinator, the heritage breed of livestock, and the sourdough culture rising in your flour. Know where your food has come from by the very way it tastes, its freshness telling you how far it may have traveled, the hint of mint in the cheese suggesting what the goat has eaten, the terroir of the wine reminding you of the lime in the stone you stand upon so that you can stand up for the land that has offered it to you. Know where your food has come from by ascertaining the health and wealth of those who picked and processed it, by the fertility of the soil that is left in the patch where it once grew, by the traces of pesticide found in the birds and the bees there. Know whether the bays and shoals where your shrimp and fish once swam were left richer or poorer than before you and your kin ate from them. Know where your food comes from by the richness of the stories told around the table, recalling all that was harvested nearby during the years that came before you, when your predecessors and ancestors roamed the same woods and neighborhoods where you and yours now roam. Know them by the songs sung to praise them, by the handmade tools kept to harvest them, by the rites and feasts held to celebrate them, by the laughter let loose to show them our affection. Know where your foods come from by the patience displayed while putting them up, while peeling, skinning, coring or gutting them, while pit roasting, poaching or fermenting them, while canning, salting or smoking them, while arranging them on a plate for our eyes to behold. Know where your food comes from by the slow savoring of each and every morsel, by letting their fragrances lodge in your memory, reminding you of just exactly where you were the very day that you became blessed by each of their distinctive flavors. When you know where your food comes from, you can give something back to those lands and waters. That rural culture, that migrant harvester, curer, smoker, poacher, roaster, or vintner, you can give something back to that soil, something fecund and fleeting, like compost, or something lasting and legal, like protection. We, as humans, have not been given roots as obvious as those of trees. The surest way we have to large ourselves within this blessed earth is by knowing where our food comes from. pretty profound. And of course, everything starts with the soil. The soil is the foundation. The food comes from the soil. Soil content is can be described as having three components, your physical, your chemical, and your biological. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at these. Physical is pretty easy, pretty intuitive, how it looks, acts, and feels. It's often described as loamy, sandy, clay-like, that sort of thing. The chemical is, is the complete chemistry, and I want to emphasize the complete chemistry because it is so much more than the NPK that you see on your fertilizer bag at the garden center. We're going to discuss a little more about the NPK if, if you're not real familiar with, with what it is. Moving on into the biological part is the actual life in the soil. Uh, obviously your worms and your bugs that you can see, but also your microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, and the microbes making not only the soil life possible, but enhancing and completing the, the plant growth as well. Our task is to build a house for the biology. I've heard that term used often in biological agriculture. And this is where we're going to start. There's a pyramid here. It starts with the physical, goes into the chemical, and then the biological. And we are focused a lot on building the physical and chemical portions of the soil. And the biological sometimes will happen by itself. And we can definitely help things along. You have to do it in this order because it's akin to adding earthworms into a hard, clay-packed soil. Um, the worms are just going to die. If you don't have the physical characteristics for uh, the worms to be able to move in there with the, the soil loose enough and holding enough water but not too much, but not too dry, also with the chemistry there, with the nutrients, with the uh, trace elements and trace minerals, 
in the right uh, amounts. Uh, also with the food there, only then can the earthworms be supported and only then can the biological part uh, start to happen and, and take hold. And when the biology does start to happen and take hold, things get really exciting because the health, uh, the fertility and the vitality of that garden soil goes into an increasing positive spiral every year. So you're going to see better production, more pest and disease resistance, uh, better adaptations uh, year after year, which really, really does become exciting. So here we have a foundational recipe for life. You start with fertile soil, you take heirloom seed, uh, and you get healthy food, which also equals healthy people. Uh, sounds fairly simple, doesn't it? Um, I, it, it we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a look at this. I love these old posters. This is from uh, this is a Freedom Garden poster from 1917. Uh, they were called Freedom Gardens in, in World War I and Victory Gardens in World War II. And Uncle Sam says garden to cut food costs. And it was applicable in 1917, and it's even more applicable today. And if you look at uh, what he's holding there, uh, farm gardens and city gardens, uh, there's really not any place that you can't garden to some extent to grow some of your own food. And we're going to look about, uh, we're going to look at this a little bit more. One of the first things we need to look at is what exactly is healthy soil, and we need to, to determine what this is so that we can we can go go forward. Um, all life depends on the top two and a half to four inches of soil, um, and and looking at it, it's from about here down to a, about here. If if you look. All the way down in here, this is bedrock, and this is bedrock that's decomposing, and, and uh, the, the, the roots are bringing up bits and pieces as you see the smaller smaller bits. But it's in this very top level where all the growth happens. Uh, some people are familiar with what's called the A, B, and C horizon levels, and that's really what we're talking about. It's it's the very it's where the the grass roots down to the tree roots are. It's where all of the minerals are available um, in the right uh, concentrations and it's where the plants typically situate their roots to bring uh, nutrients and minerals up in up through their roots so that they can grow and of course the the big question is how do we get to healthy soil we're going to take just a little bit of a detour um, into history and introduce what NPK is and how it came about uh, for those that aren't familiar, NPK is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The K stands for calium. It's a German name um, that alchemists use for potassium um, so that there wouldn't be the confusion on uh, two Ps. Chemistry is not a really old science. Um, the natural, the 92 natural elements um, wouldn't, the late 1700s, and Mendeleev published his periodic table in, in the 1870s. Justice, uh, Justice von Liebig uh, in, in the 1840s burned some barley grains and analyzed what was left and that's where NPK really came from. The, the biggest elements were the nitrogen, uh, nitrogen phosphorus and, and potassium. He reasoned that he, he was seeing these because th the barley had pulled these nutrients from the soil and therefore the soil was depleted in those elements and needed to be replaced. Of course that's the beginning and, and that's right. Um, the old idea of uh, humus and composting and, and breaking down the organic matter was, was really out of fashion at this point. This is where chemistry was the new golden child. The German industrialist jumped on the NPK. It was very cheap and easy to manufacture. Um, growth happened very well, and a lot of people got um, got very wealthy. And and this was the start of the chemical agricultural industry. Of course, as one takes the stage and the other is dropped back. So the composting, manure, the humus, and, and building the soil really became old-fashioned and out of date. At that point, they thought, oh, all we need is NPK and we can just go to the races. And of course, this was the beginning of chemical agriculture, and it did great for about 10 to 20 years. After that, 
uh, the farmers started to realize that they needed to put more and more uh, of these chemical these chemicals onto the soil to get the same results. Uh, however, the the industrialists kept uh, kept making a lot of money, um, and they were not interested in in changing things. Von Liebig, by the 1850s, had realized that there was more than just NPK. But history kind of paints him as the villain that started everything. Uh, one of the one of the things that he had found in as as he continued the research into the different elements, he developed what he called the law of the minimum. And we're going to look at that in uh, in just a second. There's a biochemical sequence for plant nutrition, and this is where healthy soil really gets started. And this is why I, I said early on, this is much more than just your NPK levels. There's, this biochemical sequence has been studied and, and really kind of learned and, and validated in the past uh, probably 15 to 20 years. It starts with boron, which activates silicon. Uh, that um, carries everything else. Um, it's often been said in the biological agriculture that silicon is the truck and boron is the steering wheel. Silicon uh, starts with calcium, which binds nitrogen, which forms amino acids, DNA, um, in a, all sorts of very important things. Uh, the nitrogen then uh, binds magnesium, which transfers energy via phosphorus into carbon to form sugars, uh, which then ties potassium, and potassium has been called the pump that uh, pumps the sap up into the, into the uh, leaves and, and uh, from the roots. Um, magnesium is the center for chlorophyll, so there's there's a lot of very important things uh, that that go on here. And this cascading effect is the basis of plant growth. Here's a visual rep representation from the periodic table uh, of the same biochemical sequence we just talked about. Something to notice is that nitrogen is the fourth most important um, in the sequence. Phosphorus is number six, and um, potassium is uh, is number eight. So you can see the NPK is definitely not uh, the most important. There's definitely some other factors going on here. So here's the law of the minimum that uh, it states that the plant growth is determined by the scarcest or most limiting nutrient. If even one of the, of the required nutrients is deficient, uh, the plant will not grow and produce at its optimum. It doesn't mean that the plant will not grow at all. It just means that it will be nutrient starved, it will be stressed, it will be diseased, it will be uh, or susceptible to disease, it will be uh, susceptible to, to pest and uh, insect uh, attacks. This is precisely why fertile, properly mineralized, nutrient-rich soil is so vital to the health and productivity of the plants and our own health. We're going to look at this a little bit more. From what we've seen, we've introduced uh, quite, quite a few concepts here. Building off of the law of the minimum, and we're going to go right into compost, and this is really where we, uh, with Terroir Seeds, advocate on, on building your garden soil, and we'll explain why. All of the techniques we're going to look at here are vital, little known, or little understood, but they're not difficult. Some of these have uh, history several thousand years. Some of them have uh, several hundred years, and a couple of them have ten years of very recent research. As Joel Salatin said with Polyface Farms, um, one of our heroes, it's not difficult. It's just different. This is a little different way of looking at things. Um, and it really works. And this is the beautiful part of it, is all of these techniques have uh, been proven time and time again. We start with compost. Because it's very easy to understand, and compost has been accepted and, and demonstrated for a long time. We're going to look at what we call complete compost, or soil food. Um, and what you'll understand what I mean by complete compost here in a little bit. Everything that grows requires minerals and nutrients in specific amounts, back to the law of the minimum. These come from the soil and must be replenished to maintain or increase the health and productive capacity of the soil. 
Um, we start with the compost because uh, compost is then fed to the garden twice a year in the fall and then again in the spring uh, to give that um, replenishment to the garden soil. For a number of years, just adding simple compost or rotted manure or vegetable material to the garden was considered to be adequate to replenish the materials. Uh, we now know that that is not correct. Um, and, and there's some, still some debate about it. Is, is, um, you know, what, what doesn't compost help? Well, it adds uh, organic matter and organic content to the soil, but it's not going to replenish the, the minerals. You have to do some, you have to, to kind of look through the chain of events. Uh, you're using an animal manure, you know, horse or cow manure. You have to look at the feed, the hay, the grass that that animal ate. You have to realize that that animal uses, in, in the process of eating the food, it uses minerals and nutrients to keep itself alive. You have to look at the where the hay and the grass was grown. Was that grown on well-mineralized, healthy, vital, fertile soils? In America today, the answer is going to be no. Almost almost exclusively. So you're starting out somewhat mineralized, mineral deficient. Uh, you're not growing hay and, and alfalfa on the most fertile soils in the world. Um, that's for vegetable production. That's for food production. So everything is lacking a little bit along the way. And then the animals, of course, are taking their share. So this is why we talk about adding these back in. Dr. William Albrecht, who is one of the pioneer uh, soil scientists on biological um, soil replenishment, one of his most famous quotes, a well-fed soil leads to well-fed crops, well-fed people, and animals. And this is where Joel Salatin's statement really comes in. It's not difficult, it's just different. It's, it's easy to incorporate these beneficial elements into the compost. Here's where we get into a little bit of the nitty-gritty and introduce some of these concepts that I've alluded to. We saw the, phys the pyramid before, physical, chemical, biological. We're going to break it down a little bit more. We're going to introduce biochar or charcoal, manure-based compost, and coffee grounds. In the chemistry side, we're going to look at mineralization, molasses, and milk. The biological side, we're going to look at earthworms, the mycorrhizal fungi, and the beneficial microbes. So now you have an idea of how this section is going to be presented, um, and you can refer back to this if you need to. Charcoal or biochar, um, we consider to be one of the or the foundational uh, ingredients in building really truly healthful soils. And I'm not just talking about how to improve your soil this year for this growing season or for next spring. The, half, or the, the lifespan of biochar or charcoal is considered to be about 1600 years at this point. What is biochar? Biochar or charcoal is wood or um, plant material that has been burned in, um, in the absence of oxygen. It's not fireplace ash. Uh, fireplace ash is alkaline. Um, it can be used, but it won't have the same benefits. Charcoal or biochar is hardwood lump charcoal. You can get this at Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, Sam's Club and, and uh, Costco carry them in 40-pound bags. A lot of times they're mesquite charcoal. Um, and they're going to look like just burned pieces of wood. Um, it, it, you can read through here and see uh, some of the benefits of the biochar or the charcoal. And just reading over it, if there wasn't reams and reams of research from 20 or 30 different universities, this is going to read like a snake oil salesman's dream, is it pretty much does everything. But it really does everything. It, it's just kind of amazing. Um, it acts as a sponge, it acts as a house, it acts as a complete living system, not only for your mycorrhizae and your, and your microbes, um, but it acts as a sponge for water and for nutrients and, and minerals. One of the things that is key in all of the university research is the charcoal needs to be charged or activated with minerals and trace elements prior to it becoming useful in the garden soil. This is why we use the charcoal in the compost to begin with, because it takes three to six months to really charge and activate.
we're going to look at uh, the, the mineral part of it here in just a second. Here's what charcoal or biochar looks like as, after it's been crushed. You can do this at home. This was Stone Age techniques, uh, the terra preta in the Amazon. Uh, it was stone tools to cut the trees down, several months to convert the large trees to charcoal, and they would crush it up and incorporate it into the soil. Some of the depths of the terra preta in the Amazon are two meters, uh, a little over six feet. Um, so the, in the fertility is some of the top three most fertile soils in the world, even though those soils have not been added to in over a thousand years. This is a little large to my taste. I like the, the charcoal to be crushed to about the size of rice to a grain of corn. Um, it just gives more surface area for the microbes and all of the, the nutrients to attach to. And one of the amazing things is once it's in the soil, after about three to six weeks, the charcoal turns white, and you'll see the activation actually happening. It's pretty amazing stuff. As we've talked about compost, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're talking about manure-based compost here. Doesn't mean that a leaf-based compost can't work. We just have access to horses. We have horses ourselves. Um, and the classic French intensive gardening method is based off of horse manure and straw. In fact, um, the French perfected the intensive small-scale vegetable gardening around Paris um, for about 150 years prior to the 1940s. One of the amazing things, about 90% of all the vegetables sold in the Paris markets were grown on only about 6% of the land inside the city limits. I love to use that when people say, oh, uh, biological or organic um, agriculture cannot feed the world today. Um, in the cities, in places if you don't have access to, if you don't have your own horses, use chickens. Um, you can use leaf litter, you can use rabbit uh, manure, any kind of animal-based manure. If you frequent the farmer's market, get to know a farmer. I'm sure that they have more than enough manure and they would, be, they would love to have you come and get some. Um, different manures are a beautiful thing. The traditional uh, 1940s, 1930s farms with sheep and cattle and goats and pigs and horses had a variety of manures. Part of them were ruminants, which had a lot of microbial activity in their manure. Part of them weren't, such as your, your horses, that gave really good chopped up vegetable ma ma material. If you can get if you can get a, a combination of these manures into your compost, it's only going to help. You definitely don't have to, it's just something if you have it available. Next up is coffee grounds. Coffee grounds is kind of a unique, some, some people know about it, some people don't. Um, Traditionally, coffee grounds were thought to be acidic. Uh, recent research has, university research has proven that coffee grounds are neutral and they actually act as a buffer. And what the beauty, the beauty of, of the buffering activity is if you've got a high pH or a low pH, uh, the buffering brings it closer to that net neutral 7 pH. So if you're running an 8, 8.5 eight in your soil, um, adding coffee grounds to the compost, and, and you can add coffee grounds directly to your garden soil, um, they will help bring that pH back towards 7, whether it's acidic or basic. Um, you can add up to 25% by volume coffee grounds to your compost, um, actually to your garden soil, so you can you, you've got a, a lot higher upper limit in your compost because you're only adding the compost to the top of the garden soil. Um, coffee grounds are a good nitrogen source and worms, for whatever reason, love coffee grounds. They actually kind of act as a worm attractant. Places to get your coffee grounds are any of your coffee shops, Starbucks, uh, your local coffee roaster, your local coffee house, um, restaurants, uh, you, know, the, you, you have to get a little creative here. When you walk in, you're going to feel a little strange. Um, excuse me, I'd like to get your old used coffee grounds. But if you explain that they're, you're going to use them in compost, I've yet to see a place uh, when you walk in with a friendly attitude and explain what you're doing that doesn't just 
wow, this is really cool. We don't have to throw this stuff away now. Um, Starbucks has a na nationwide uh, waste reduction program. So any Starbucks you're around, they're typically going to have a bag or a bin uh, with their used coffee grounds that you're, um, you know, you're more than welcome to use. We've finished up the physical characteristics and now we're going to go into the chemical sequence or the chemical characteristics of building the soil. First up is mineralization. Talked about this just a little bit and remember the biochemical sequence. Certain things are used in certain order uh, in certain amounts. Well you have to replace that because every living thing uses minerals. Um, so we have to replace that in the soil to supply healthy plants to grow healthy food to, to keep us healthy. One of the items that we really recommend, um, we do, I do not have any affiliation with them uh, right now, the company, the product is called Azomite. A-Z-O-M-I-T-E stands for A to Z of minerals, including trace elements. It's a volcanic uh, deposit in Utah that is mined, and it's, and it's a kind of a unique situation. They guess uh, or estimate about 30 million years ago there was a volcanic eruption which brought a lot of minerals from deep in the earth. Um, soon after that, or perhaps at the same time, there was an inland, or there was an ocean, and it was an inland sea at that point. So this volcanic um, eruption was covered by a layer of sea minerals. And so you've got the best of both worlds with the volcanic minerals from deep in the earth as well as uh, the ancient sea minerals. There's about 70 uh, minerals and trace elements in azomite. Um, you can get it in a 40 pound bag, you can look it up online. Um, be careful of the shipping. Um, they also have a brand new product out that is granulated with molasses and we'll talk about molasses here in just a second. When you're looking at minerals, uh, you kind of have to get out of the, the garden store box. Um, your feed store uh, or your feed supply store can really help with some of these, such as oyster shells for chickens. Oyster shells are pretty much pure calcium that you can incorporate into your garden soil, um, and they're hugely beneficial for your tomatoes and, and a lot of the other um, uh, plants uh, in, in your garden. Um, your molasses is another thing and, and a lot of times when you're looking at these types of things um, you're going to be able to buy them at the feed store for a lot better price than you're going to be able to get it at the garden store. Um, you know your feed store is also a great uh, supply for straw, for mulch and, and your compost. Molasses is another key ingredient in your in your chemistry and, and getting the chemistry where it needs to be in your in your uh, both your garden soil and your compost. What you're looking for is unsulfured blackstrap molasses. Uh, the the blackstrap has a lot higher mineral content. Uh, the other main main benefit is natural, readily available sugars for the plants and the microorganisms. Molasses has been used for years and years and years by flower growers to right as the flowers start to bloom uh, the flower growers um, the ratio is one cup of molasses to one gallon of water they will apply that solution either a drip system or a side feed to help the uh, the flowers pop and they'll bloom really aggressively and very strongly and the blooms will be longer lasting and hardier than if, if they don't use uh, the molasses. This is another thing you can get at uh, your feed supply store that's going to be a lot better price. Um, this also works great in any of your garden plants. As they start to flower, you can add it to the drip system in, in the same one cup to one gallon of water ratio. You can add it in the drip system or you can uh, uh, put it in a, in a watering can and water it uh, right on top. Uh, right as it starts, as the tomatoes or any of the crops in the garden start to flower, it's going to help boost production and those sugars really give the, the plants a nice boost. I've mentioned milk a couple of times before and I always get a surprised response when I mention milk in compost and building, building soil. Um, because it's something that is very not mainstream. Uh, partly because of the whole real or raw milk versus pasteurized milk that's being splashed across the pages and the FDA's raid on on uh, you know Amish milk farmers and, and these kind of things. 
looking at milk as a nutrient, though, um, is, is what we're looking at. The amino acids, proteins, enzymes, and natural sugars that make a milk, milk a really good food for us are the same things that make milk a wonderful food for your compost and your garden soil. There's two real big benefits here. One is, it's a, it's a, well, three, actually. It's a soil and microorganism food. It's an insecticide for soft-bodied insects. And it, uh, is, it opens up and loosens soil. Um, the soil and microorganism food is pretty easy to understand. Um, the dilution ratio, you can go one to three. Uh, so a gallon of milk can go add three gallons of water, and you're going to have the same, uh, the same efficiency. And this has been tested on a farm in northeast Nebraska for the past 10 years. Uh, the benefits are amazing. Better grass production, less insect uh, population. Uh, the cows needed, when they were on this specific pasture, needed fewer vet visits, fewer vaccinations. They produced better milk with a higher butterfat content. Uh, there were more nutrients in the milk. Um, it was a better tasting milk. Um, and once the cows were pulled off of this pasture, uh, the owner was able to hay that pasture twice as much as any other pasture. Um, the insecticide part is kind of amazing. If you use it in a dilution of one to two, so one gallon of milk uh, to two gallons of water, um, you can uh, use that as a, as a leaf spray. The beautiful thing of this is soft-bodied insects like grasshoppers do not have a pancreas. So the sugars, the natural sugars in the milk, are poison to your grasshoppers. It's very similar to the molasses uh, that we just talked about. You can do the same thing with that. So it will chase, literally chase the, the uh, grasshoppers away. Another thing that's been found with raw milk applied to soil is it loosens the soil up. Um, in as little as 30 days, uh, in, in a pasture, there was a strip along a pasture that was applied at the ratio of um, three gallons per milk at a 50% dilution rate, uh, three gallons per acre. So a very, very small amount uh, was sprayed on this, on this patch. And 30 days later, uh, they used a soil penetrometer. The treated part had a resistance of a, and a soil penetrometer is a one meter steel rod, and it, and it measures how, how much force is required to drive that rod down the one meter. On the treated part, after 30 days, it was 100 pounds to drive the rod one meter. On the untreated part, it was 300 pounds. So in 30 days, the milk reduced the penetration. It loosened the soil up by a 200 pound uh, margin. Mycorrhizal fungi are microscopic uh, group of fungi that have become a little better known. They develop symbiotic or beneficial relationships with about 90% of the world's food crop species. Um, this has been known for quite some time. Recent research is showing that uh, biochar or charcoal acts as housing for the mycorrhizae. They will colonize, the spores will colonize the little hollow tubules in the charcoal and send out these tiny little root hairs um, that are quite a bit smaller than a human hair. And they can, these, these little root hairs, they can send out anywhere from 15 to 25 inches. And this is from uh, a fungi that's microscopic in size. So that would be like one of us in San Diego sending out um, a route all the way to New York. Just amazing. And it increases the nutrient reach, but it all the mycorrhizae actually helps move nutrients around. If, if a plant needs certain nutrients, it'll move them to that um, in exchange for sugars that, that the plant provides. The, the mycorrhizae in the charcoal also help monitor and can help control pH um, in, in a kind of a complex um, evolution. But it's, it's been shown that they can change pH over time. Um, they really um, help monitor and mobilize nutrients such as phosphorus, nitrogen, zinc, iron, calcium, magnesium, manganese, sulfur, and several other nutrients. Um, so it's really mycorrhizae combined with the charcoal really have some uh, in incredible potential and incredible positive benefits. Mycorrhizae um, 
the milk um, and the molasses are, are needed to be added after the compost has finished cooking. As the temperature comes down, because mycorrhizae are obviously living, you don't want to kill them in 160 degree compost. So after the temperatures start dropping and, and the, the hot part of the compost is finished, is when you'll start adding uh, the mycorrhizal fungi. We talked a little bit about earthworms early on, and, and you have to build the biology. You, you know, have to build for the biology. And, and earthworms are they're an excellent indicator species. When somebody calls and asks, what do they need to do in their garden soil? Well, the first thing you want to do is see if you've got any earthworms. And if you dig up a d big double handful and you've got two or three earthworms, well, you're, you're headed in the right direction. If you dig up that double handful and you've got 10 or 20 or more earthworms, you've got some really good soil. Um, indicator species, I call them a canary in a coal mine, um, they are not going to be where soil is compacted, hard, sterile, not full of life. Um, that's what we talked about early on of building the house. Once the earthworms move in, they really kind of help accelerate the whole upward positive spiral uh, that we talked about before. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about with the biological part of your beneficial microbes, and this is another you know whole discipline in itself. A lot of times, once you get the physical and chemical uh, parts of the soil built and moving along nicely, people will notice that the mycorrhizal fungi move in or the earthworms move in, even though your garden may be surrounded by some pretty hostile environment. The earthworms just kind of start showing up. Um, and and this, is, this is natural. The beneficial microbes will do the exact same thing. Um, there are additives, um, there are brews and teas that you can buy as well. Once you have the visual earthworms and pill bugs and, and obvious life in your soil, the beneficial microbes will follow. So don't worry, don't worry too much about that. So we've finished building our soil. We now have the absolute perfect soil. We've built the, the compost. Uh, we add that compost to the garden soil and work it in twice a year. We've got a ton of earthworms. Things are just, you've got black gold. Things are just amazing. So now we need some seeds. What are heirloom seeds? Let's do some definitions so we're all on the same page. Heirloom is anything of value. Um, and it doesn't have to be economic value to a person. For instance, great-grandmother's uh, rocking chair, or the family china, the fam family silver, or uh, Aunt Ruby's German green tomato. Uh, something worth passing down. Open pollinated is what we refer to when we mean that you can buy a packet of seeds, you plant those, you save the seed from that tomato, and you replant that, and you can get the same type and variety of tomato year after year after year. A hybrid is a seed or a, a, a plant produced by artificially cross-pollinating two genetically different plants from the same species. In other words, a red and a green tomato or two different types of corn. The difference here is those seeds will not grow true if they're replanted. Uh, case in point, you get a tomato from the grocery store. Wow, this is actually a really good tasting tomato. Let's just pretend here. Um, you save the seed and the plants come up. You're going to have some sort of variation between the two parents. You're not going to have the same exact tomato that you planted. Genetically modified organism. This is something that uh, the DNA has been injected from a completely different species. In other words, you've got a, a, a corn that has a frog gene inserted into it uh, for specific uh, characteristics. And we're very much against uh, G GE, genetic engineering, or genetically modified organisms, simply because never in the history of, of mankind or the world has different species been injected and introduced into uh, the DNA. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with this. Organic is a certain standard. Uh, the USDA sets the standard and you have a number of certifying agencies. Um, typically 
in a nutshell, organic means it's grown without uh, chemical inputs. It's grown in a, in a natural manner, not necessarily a biological manner. So now that we've got some, some definitions, let's, let's look a little further. So let's be clear. All heirloom seeds are open pollinated, but not all open pollinated are heirlooms. Uh, an example of this would be the Oregon Spring Tomato. Dr. Daggett developed at, at Oregon State University uh, four early set of tomatoes in the Oregon uh, cool spring weather. Traditional plant breeding, uh, this took about 18 years to develop and stabilize this, this tomato. So they're open pollinated, you can save your seeds and get the exact same tomato the year, the year after, but it's not an old variety. No heirlooms are hybrid because you can save your seed and no heirlooms are GMO. The heirlooms may or may not be organic. That depends on how they were grown and if they were certified. Looking at what I call the arc of sustainability, you start with your open pollinated seeds. Uh, these are seeds you can save. These, is, these are the seeds that have kept mankind alive for 15,000 years. Then you have your hybrid seeds. Um, we'll talk about these a little bit more in just a minute. Um, you can't save these because they're, they're not going to grow true. At the very end of the scale you have your genetic mod genetically modified seeds, meaning um, not only do you not want to because we don't know what the, the side effects are of different species genes in the DNA of that corn, but you're going to be sued um, if, if you try to save the seeds. It's just, it's, it's really kind of a mess. So why use heirloom seeds? Why use open pollinated seeds to begin with? Heirlooms are ideally suited for small-scale agriculture, home, uh, home gardeners, human-scale agriculture, um, home gardeners, small growers, farmers market growers, that sort of thing. Um, this type of agriculture has shown to be um, more productive, less destructive, and more profitable per acre um, over time. Um, Organic Gardening just completed a 30-year study of organic versus conventional agriculture, and organic agriculture has shown to be more resilient, uh, building the soil better. It's more productive in drier years. It's also more uh, profitable. Another study um, was showing that some industrial farms, these are your huge conglomerate farms, earn um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $21 per acre per year. So this kind of explains why they need 30 and 40,000 acres to farm just to stay above water. Whereas a number of small scale farms, 10 acres or less, a um, lot less inputs, a lot less um, intensive petrochemical inputs, some of these smaller farms can earn upwards of $20,000 per year per acre. So there's a lot of benefits here, not just profitability, but your biodiversity, your, the amount of food grown, and the different varieties of grown uh, food coming from the smaller farms keeps the health of the soil better, keeps the health of the plants better, um, and it's able to continue year after year after year. That's really the definition of sustainability. So your heirloom seeds fit really well into the smaller production, the, the home gardener, from this. What about hybrids? This is a question that comes up a lot, uh, mainly due to the marketing of hybrids, of production and disease resistance and all these uh, desirable traits. They never mention flavor in that. Hybrids were bred for commercial use and profit. Higher yield, greater uniformity, more even ripening, uh, resistance to transportation, but you never, men you never see flavor mentioned in there. Hybrids were started in the 1920s and 30s uh, when produce was shipped typically less than 50 miles to a market. Uh, they needed more even production uh, for, for those markets. Taste and freshness were very important because a lot of that market in the cities were recent transplant from the country. 
and those people remembered what fresh produce tasted like. Now, if you look forward 60 years, where we are today, the characteristics today are the iconic, colorful, yet flavorless supermarket tomato that tastes the same year-round and that we all know and love. So what about the hybrids? Are they really a better tomato? Hybrids are very labor-intensive to produce. Um, it's usually done in developing countries or in Asian countries where the labor is much cheaper. Um, these four photos show the process that has to be gone through for each and every flower. In other words, in this first photo, this flower is being worked on, but he's going to have to or she's going to have to work on this flower next, then this flower, uh, then these two flowers back here before they can move off of this stalk. Um, for each and every flower, they have to um, remove the anther cone, uh, cut the petals, and hand pollinate. Um, and you can see, you know, this is all handwork. There is no machine to do this. Each quarter acre of indeterminate tomatoes will require two to three people working five to six weeks. Now, this is not an eight-hour workday. This is a 12 to 16-hour workday. The determinate tomatoes require almost basically twice as many people the same amount of time to perform the same hybridization on a quarter acre of tomato production. Indeterminate tomatoes, of course, are those that continue to set fruit throughout the year, the, throughout the season. Determinate tomatoes do typically one bloom, one flush of flowers, and a large, uh, a large bloom of uh, fruit, and then sometimes they'll set a second, but not, not very often. So this is also kind of a response in why hybrids. I mean, why, you know, why do we want to use this? Um, this is very unsustainable when you know you can't save your seeds. So heirlooms and open pollinated varieties offer a range of genetic diversity that's just not possible in hybrids. Um, a lot of the heirlooms have been passed from generation to generation. Um, they've, they've been selected because of their productivity, because of their flavor, because of their nutrition. Um, for instance, the King Umberto tomato, was um, it's the oldest named uh, Italian tomato it was named for King Humbert in the 1650s and it's still alive today so obviously it was tasty enough productive enough and uh, resistant enough to pests and different climates that it it was carried through passed down from generation to generation and still treasured today um, Saving your seeds and replanting them is where you as a gardener can really capitalize on the, adaptabi uh, the adaptability of the heirlooms and open pollinated. They will adapt to your specific garden and I've seen tomatoes adapt in as little as two to three years and show remarkable noticeable differences over uh, every other tomato in the garden. Hybrids simply cannot do that. When you get to this point in the conversation with a lot of folks, it always turns to production. What about production? Heirlooms have lower yield. They're more finicky. Don't we need hybrids to feed the world? I think we're asking the wrong question entirely. America's fascination with quantity over quality in agriculture has led us to where we are today, which a lot of people will openly acknowledge is broken, is failing, and is headed in the wrong direction. Some of these people admitting this are large-scale farmers. We have industrial mega farms where tractors are so large that with their equipment hooked up, their discs, it's hard to turn around, just simply turn around on an acre or two acres. And they can't make an, a, a pass in a three-acre spot. And they're, they're leaving so many of the corners open and untouched that half of the way, acreage is wasted. Sure, our yields per acre have skyrocketed, but the soils are, are depleted, and we have fresh food in our supermarket with a fraction of the nutrition compared to the 1960s and 1970s. Corporate agriculture today requires three to five times the amount of fertilizers, pesticides, and insecticides as their parents in the 1960s. 
Many large-scale farmers that we've talked to are worried. They have openly expressed the concern that they have killed the soil. So production and hybrids, you know, production is not all it cracked up to be. It's not everything we've been led to believe it should be. Here's a really good chart showing as our focus on production has dominated, soil health, plant health, and our health has decreased. The years are a little skewed because the, the tests weren't done in a linear fashion. But this chart is an average mineral content on selected vegetables from 1914 to 1997, specifically 1914, 1982, uh, 1963, and 1997. The averages are calcium, magnesium, and iron in specifically cabbage, lettuce, tomatoes, and spinach. And anybody looking at this chart is not going to see a lot of positive in the amount of uh, nutrients as time goes forward. This is where hybridization, this is where industrial agriculture has led us. So what are our options? Start small, start local, start in your garden. Small farmers, as I've talked before, have better production, better profitability, a lot of better biodiversity. What each one of us can do is if we grow even some of our own food in our own garden, in our own soil, that we do what I've shown, we can increase our nutrition simply and easily. Not only that, but the rate of return is incredible. $100 of seeds has grown anywhere from $700 to $1,000 in several gardens across the USA. Those studies are three years old. So the numbers are going to be significantly higher now, especially from the past two years where uh, food prices have, have really started to skyrocket. Where else can you get um, a six to eight hundred percent on your return invest on, uh, return on your investment. Another study, um, informal study done by a gardener, uh, had a twelve by thirty five foot garden saved from twenty five to thirty three hundred in food costs. The twenty five hundred dollars was hard dollars that were easy to calculate. Um, the thirty three hundred went to savings in fuel, savings in time. Uh, better health from working in the garden, uh, better physical condition, um, that would equate to savings at a gym or a health club or, or that sort of thing. So there are some tremendous benefits from doing even a small, simple garden in your own backyard. Bringing this all around into the food portion, we've looked at some really incredibly beneficial ways to build your soil. Um, starting with the compost, feeding the garden. Um, then we've looked at why heirloom and open pollinated seeds are quite a bit better for human scale productivity and for food, for, for true nutritious food production. Now let's look at what's the true value, and this is something that's really missed a lot, what's the true value of homegrown local food? Um, and what we're going to look at is some of the costs of um, commercially industrial produced food that are missing in uh, food that you grow locally or from your farmers market or that sort of thing. Um, because the, it's easy to assign specific costs to homegrown local food, but, but the thing that is hard to calculate is what is missing. For instance, one of the biggest things is the time lag from the field to your plate. Commercial pr produce has an average of five to seven day time lag. Some of it's quite a bit more from when it's picked to when it goes into um, the grocery store for you to buy. From the field it goes to cold storage, is somewhere on the farm or sometimes close by. Once there's enough volume in the cold storage, it's shipped to a regional warehouse for sorting, which is sorted for delivery to different grocery chains. Uh, one grower may, may grow for three or four different grocery chains. One grower may only grow for one. It, it just kind of depends. So after sorting, it's shipped to dedicated regional distribution centers. Um, so in other words, one farmer may grow for Safeway and Kroger's and Vons. Um, so it, it goes from the, the distribution center to the each uh, chain's distribution center, which then it goes from there to the supermarket. So there's where your five to seven minimum day 
lag time comes in. And this is the same whether you live in New York and it's grown in Yuma or you live in Prescott, Arizona and it's grown in Yuma. It, it's the same time. Sometimes it's longer getting to New York. A second big thing that is missed in local food is the distance traveled from the field to your plate. And this is something that's been talked to um, and addressed by Michael Pollan and, and several others. You know, we've heard the 1,100 to 1,500 miles to get to your plate. And sure, that makes sense if you're talking about a New Yorker that's eating lettuce grown in Yuma or, or you know, the Central Valley of California. However, um, food that is grown physically 100 to 200 miles away still makes that 1,100 mile process because of the time lag that we just talked about. Because every time that that food is moved, it not only is the time lag, but there's distance involved. And uh, that distance adds up. And of course, every time that it's moved, it's moved by diesel semi-truck. That brings us to, you've got the time lag, you've got the distance, and of course then what happens is you start getting wastage and spoilage. Um, something that hit the news uh, a year or so ago is the estimate that 40, um, some estimates are better than 40, some are around 40, but f up to 40% of the food grown in America never makes it to our plate it rots from the field to the cold storage to the distribution center to the grocery store and so there's there's a huge amount of food that is lost and can't even be sold before it, it, it comes to the grocery store so this is another part that's completely missing in a homegrown or local food um, uh, situation So looking at the benefits of local food, looking at the benefits of homegrown food, and bringing everything to, uh, to, to finish the cycle, terroir is not fixed, but it changes with time. We've seen how we can improve our terroir. We can improve our soil health and quality, and from that improve the plant and uh, produce vegetable uh, quality. and nutrition, which of course improves our health and nutrition. But when you look at it, terroir is not favored by efficiency and high throughputs, and that's a term that your industrial agriculture uses. Um, it's a model best suited to home gardeners and uh, smaller growers, your farmers markets, your CSA type growers. And as we've seen, smaller scale agriculture is very often many more times productive not just in a qualitative, uh, but a quantitative standpoint as well. And of course you have the productivity that comes in. So there is the cycle of terroir um, all together. Hopefully this will entice you to dig a little further. Um, I encourage you to contact us. Um, the next slide will have uh, some, some resources for, for you. I want to leave you with this statement by Dr. Mitch Gaynor, the New York Strain Center for Cancer Prevention. And, and this is very telling in today's age when a lot of the cancer uh, supposed cures are chemistry. We have seen the future of medicine and the future is food. There's so many health benefits, uh, positive powerful health benefits from locally grown um, healthy food. Here's some resources. We definitely encourage you to contact us. Uh, Terroir Seeds, uh, underwoodgardens.com, uh, the phone number there. Um, Heirloom Seeds blog, this will be posted there and um, all of the education and, and um, uh, soil building and recipe uh, that, we, that we do goes there. Acres USA is a fantastic resource for soil building education and biological farming. It's done on a large scale, um, but don't let that put you off. Um, everything that's done on a thousand acre farm biologically, uh, you can do in your home garden. And there's some really amazing things that they've done. Acres USA here in 2011 is celebrating their 40th anniversary. So I would have to say they're one of the first, if not the first, um, to look at the biological component of, of agriculture. And then Agricola and Soil Minerals is a really good resource for um, the different soil minerals if you can't get them locally. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, presentation. 
Uh, again, my name is Stephen with Terroir Seeds. If you have questions, please contact us, and I would love to uh, correspond or chat with you. Thanks so much.